Hi, I'm Nathan with Holstein Gases. During this training module, we're going to discuss MIG welding and troubleshooting the MIG welding system. We're going to focus on the wire drive system and items that can cause porosity, spatter, burn back, inconsistent wire feeding, and voltage drops on ground leads. So the first item we're going to talk about is weld porosity. Weld porosity is a weld discontinuity. It is not necessarily a weld defect. There's a difference between weld discontinuities and weld defects. Weld defects deem the weld rejectable, and a weld discontinuity under the particular code or limit, under a limit that the code suggests is okay or acceptable. So some of the causes of porosity are excessive nozzle to work distance, excessive travel speeds, winds or drafts in the welding area blowing the shielding gas away, holes or leaks in the gas hose, improper flow rates. Improper welding parameters can also cause porosity. A bad MIG gun can cause porosity. Contamination on the work plate is a big cause of porosity. And the list just goes on and on. But here I'm going to show you a, a simple item to check that causes porosity and is often overlooked and leads to extended troubleshooting times. So here we have a bench top feeder and this is the wire drive housing of the feeder that houses the drive rolls and the gears that push the wire through the system. And here is just a simple MIG gun with a power pin, okay? So typically when you get a new system you're going to set it up and you're going to push the power pin in to the wire drive housing and it's going to get seated all the way as far as it'll go. And then the proper thing to do is to tighten this nut down, hand tight as tight as you can get it, and that should be good and you should have a sound system. However, what happens a lot of times is this nut doesn't get tightened down all the way, okay? So it'll be semi-loose and over about a day's work of welding, the gun will slowly start to slip out. And as it slips out, the o-ring will, will become exposed and you'll notice that there's a little black o-ring right here okay and this o-ring will cause air to be aspirated into the gas line of the MIG gun and this will always cause porosity and it's kind of hard to find because sometimes it's uh, just barely sticking out so if I go ahead and pull this all the way out you'll notice these two, the two O-rings right here, okay? So these two O-rings seal these holes from where the gas comes into the wire drive block to put force the gas into the, the MIG gun, okay? So these O-rings are very critical, um, that they're completely seated inside the wire drive block, also that they're actually installed. Sometimes you'll find MIG guns with power pins that have O-rings that are missing or cracked and worn. So these things need to be replaced pretty regularly. This is something that's commonly overlooked. So here I go, I'll seat it all the way in, tied it down, and then you should be good to go. Another system that is common for having the O-rings not get completely seated when installing the gun is with a push-pull system like similar with a Miller Matic 350P. So here is the push-pull power pin and you can see the o-rings down here and a lot of times this is, gun is very tricky to get installed because it's really tough to push all the way in there and so I've had cases where a customer will buy a brand new machine and they'll call back and say hey it's welding real poorly and you won't necessarily see porosity with aluminum when this happens you'll just won't be able to weld the weld will dig right through the aluminum It'll burn right through it and it's kind of awkward looking, but it's not necessarily porosity like you'll see with uh, MIG welding on, on steel. So it may not, when they call, they may not say that it's actually porosity, it's just that it won't weld. So what you'll want to do is always, again, make sure this is completely seated and then that this knob is tightened down all the way. So next we're going to talk about burn back. And burn back is when the wire melts back to the tip and burns to the tip. And so I'm going to demonstrate burn back for you and we'll talk about it. So as you can see right here, this is an excellent example of burn back. Burn back is caused from when the wire does not feed, the voltage burns the wire that's already extended out of the tip, burns it back to the contact tip. 
And so this is a very frustrating problem. It's a very common problem, especially with robotic welding. And burn back is mostly caused by some type of inconsistent wire feeding. So this can be caused from the wire conduit, the wire liner, uh, drive roll slippage, not proper tension on the drive rolls, uh, the wire spool being too tight or too loose, bad contact tips, kinks in the gun, and the list goes on and on. So the best way to troubleshoot this is just to start looking at the wire drive system, system and making sure that everything is the way it should be. And so we're going to go over that and talk about some of the possible causes of, of burn back and how to correct them. Okay, so here is our bench top feeder again. And what you're going to notice here, we're going to talk about the spool and how to properly install the spool. Okay, so the first thing I want to show you is that on this spool, there's a nipple. Okay, this is the hub assembly that holds the spool, and there's a nipple here. And also, there's a hole inside of all 30 pound spools of wire. Okay, so that's supposed to mate up with that nipple, um, and this prevents the spool of wire from slipping. Okay, also I want to point out that there's a spring right here inside of the hub and there's also a nut on the back side of this rod. Alright, and so when you tighten that nut down, that applies tension on this hub assembly. And so the proper way to set it up is to where when you let go of the trigger, this does not continue to spool. Okay, when we let go of the trigger, we want the wire to maintain and be taut. Okay. So let's see if it's set up here. I'll pull the trigger and I'll let go and the wire stays straight. That's the way we want it. So if you can imagine if we pulled the trigger and then it continued to feed to where there's a big excessive loop of wire here, when you go to pull the trigger again, once it catches up to the drag of the system, it's going to cause a slight hesitation just for a second. Now that doesn't seem like a lot, but if it's severe enough and the wire feed speed is high enough, that can interrupt the wire feed speed just for a moment. And remember, if you're feeding wire at 600 inches per minute, it does not take very much to interrupt that, and that can cause some burn back or just some incons inconsistent or unstable welding arc. So be sure that your system is set up like this and you'll be good to go. So something else to consider when installing the spool of wire is the direction at which the wire is going to unravel or come off of the spool. As you can see here, the wire is coming off at about a 45 degree angle, but the wire drive housing in the inlet guide is sitting straight at 180 degrees. So this causes an area where the wire is going to have to make a, a, a pretty harsh bend to be accepted in the wire drive housing and this is going to cause excessive wear on the inlet guide and also is going to cause some poor feeding. So the proper way to do it is if the wire drive assembly is in this position right here would be to flip the spool over and install it to where it comes off in a straight line. That's the correct way to install the spool of wire. Now also with some of the newer feeders, there's a tension knob in the back of the wire feeder. And so we can position this at 45 degrees, tighten it down, and then now we can install our spool at where the wire comes off at about 45 degrees. And this would be ideal right here. This would allow for the wire to come off the spool and then to go into the inlet guide in a straight line so there's as minimal wear on the inlet guide as possible. So as I mentioned, with the wire drive housing set at 45 degrees, there's a nice gentle slope of the MIG gun as it goes down to the floor uh, going to the weld station. So as you can see, if I loosen that tension knob and bring it up to 180 degrees, you can see this bend that we're going to get and the MIG gun and over time this is going to get more severe and more severe and this causes a feeding issue right here in this area over time. Some other items to check on the wire drive assembly. This is an anti-wear guide. This is the inlet guide. This is installed right here and then an allen head screw goes right there and it tightens down. This prevents the inlet guide from wearing. These parts do wear so they do need to be replaced occasionally. The inlet guide needs to come all the way to the drive roll as you see right here. And here you have your intermittent 
uh, wire guide. It's important to have that installed. And there's your power pin all the way seated up to the drive roll. And it's important that these inlet guides and intermediate guides are the right size. It's not okay to use one that is too small or even too big. As a inlet guide or intermediate guide that's too big for the system or too big for the wire can cause excessive play and cause the wire to wander. And this would be really critical for a smaller wire such as an 030 or 035 because the column strength on those wires are a lot less and so it doesn't take very much for one of those wires to kink and then you can get a bird's nest or a burn back uh, at your tip. So another cause of burn back is wire slippage and so to ensure that you have the right drive roll tension we're going to talk about how to set that. So the first thing you want to do is take your wire sticking out of your MIG gun and put a slight bend into it. Loosen your tension knobs on the wire drive housing all the way loose apply the wire to a non-conductive surface and pull the trigger. Okay, so now you can see that we're pulling the trigger and the wire is slipping because it's not feeding. And so now I'm going to start tightening down the tension knob on the wire drive assembly until it starts feeding. There we go. We don't want to over tighten it. Uh, you just want to tighten it to where it's just tight enough to feed the wire and not slip. Next, to ensure we didn't over tighten it, you should be able to apply the MIG gun directly on the non-conductive surface, pull the trigger, and the wire drive should slip. And it is, and we're doing good, and just to double check, we'll put a bend in it, and then we'll feed it, and it's feeding without slipping. Another way to test to see if your wire drive system is in good shape is to loosen the idler arms on the drive rolls, pull your gun out straight like so, and then just pull the wire out of the end of the gun with no tension on the system, and it should pull very easily. You shouldn't have any trouble pulling it. You should also be able to push the wire back into the MIG gun like this. If you've really got to pull very hard to get the wire out, you can be assured that there's an obstruction in your MIG gun or liner and you need to investigate it a little bit further. But right now I think everything is okay and I don't see any problems with how hard I have to pull to get the wire to come out. So I believe we're okay. Another item to check that's really simple to check is the drive rolls. The drive rolls should be the same size as the wire that you're using. If you're using 045 wire, then you need to be using 045 drive rolls. If you're using solid wire, the groove drive rolls are recommended. If you're using a cord wire, flux cord or metal cord, most of the time a V-knurled groove is recommended. And for aluminum, you want to use a U-groove drive roll. So make sure that the proper drive rolls are installed. I've seen many times where folks will have 035 drive rolls and 045 drive rolls installed when feeding 045 wire. So sometimes things get messed up out in the field. So just ensure, ensure that the drive rolls are the correct size. Also, in a lot of robotic cells and out on the shop floor, a lot of the drive rolls tend to get covered in grease and oils from the weld cell. And so be sure they're clean. You can always brush them off with a wool brush uh, or just replace them if they get worn and there's a bunch of grease in there because that grease will contaminate the wire and can cause some arc instability and spatter from that and also just cause some slippage on the drive rolls. So just be sure you have some drive rolls that are in good shape. It's a real simple thing to check and it doesn't take very long. The last thing that we're going to talk about related to burn back is the contact tip. By some, the contact tip is considered the most important consumable in the weld MIG welding system. And I tend to agree with that because the contact tip is where the current from the power source is transferred to the wire. So it's important that the contact tip, tip be of good quality. There's different types of contact tips out there, uh, different qualities I should say. You have some cheaper copper or some softer copper that's used and so when during the welding process, as the contact tip heats up, that softer copper will co tend to misshape. And when this happens, it causes that wire to have room to move inside of that contact tip. And that wire is going to be bouncing back and forth, arcing back and forth on each side of the contact tip. And over not very long amount of time, this will cause arc spot spots inside of the contact tip and these are rough surfaces where the wire can snag momentarily causing it to burn back and it doesn't take very long for this to happen. 
So if you go with a higher quality contact tip with higher quality alloy of copper in there, uh, the contact tip can be harder and will not wear as fast and is not affected by the high heat of the welding arc as much. So contact tips are very important for manual welding. Typically, most folks use an 035 contact tip for an 035 wire. However, for robotic welding, it's very common and most recommended to use one size smaller contact tip than the wire diameter. For example, if you're using an 045 wire, it's common to use an 040 contact tip. This will allow the wire to be uh, fed out of the contact tip straighter and will allow teaching a little bit easier and more consistent. So now we're going to talk about stubbing. Stubbing is when the wire is coming out of the MIG gun and it's popping on the plate when you initially try to start the arc. This is very frustrating for welders and it causes a lot of spatter because the wire is not hot enough to melt and the arc is not hot enough to become stable as soon as you pull the trigger so it pops and stubs until it's able to get established before the actual welding arc begins. And so this, like I said, causes a lot of spatter. So I'm going to demonstrate uh, what this sounds like so you'll be familiar with it. So if you noticed, there was a couple real large pop, pop, pops before the weld, actually, the weld uh, arc actually got established and got stable. And so there's really three main causes of this. The first main cause is excessive stick out. I see this more than anything. I see uh, a, a contact tip that's maybe been hacksawed off so they could reuse it and it's sucked about an inch back into the nozzle and so they're trying to start the arc with an inch and a half stick out and that's just not going to work. It's going to pop, pop, pop and spatter every time and this stubbing is going to occur and they're going to be lots and lots of spatter at the beginning of the welds. <clears throat> Next is uh, voltage drops in the welding circuit. So anytime that you have high resistance in your welding circuit, whether it be exposed cable or a bad ground lead, this ground lead can cause uh, voltage drops. So sometimes you'll see welders take their ground leads and rather than clamping them to the work, they'll just set it on the work piece and start welding. Well, that's not going to work very well. Current's not going to travel through that very easily. It's going to arc and it's going to cause voltage drops. Also, you'll see ground leads that are in terrible shape, kind of like what you see right here. These ground leads will, over time, the first arc start may not be bad, but after a few welds, they get really, really hot. And once that resistance goes up, uh, once that heat goes up, the resistance starts to go up and that causes more voltage drops. So over the period of a day's time, the welding performance will start to deteriorate. So the best thing to do is to check your ground leads, make sure that they're sound and tight, and also make sure that the welder isn't trying to start with an excessive contact tip because he has improper consumables installed or worn consumables installed. The last thing to check is going to be the voltage. Make sure the welding parameters are set properly. Uh, a lot of times if the voltage is set too low for the wire feed speed, you'll get stubbing. So I'm going to demonstrate with a little bit higher voltage, I'm going to demonstrate what it should sound like on a good arc start. So you can notice that there wasn't any stubbing, the arc fired immediately, and that was because I used a short stick out to start the arc, and I have my parameters set properly with a good ground lead. So these are some things that cause stubbing, and keep those in mind whenever you hear those excessive poppings at the start of welds, and you'll be able to help them out and take care of that. That concludes this training module. During this training module, we discussed some common causes of porosity, stubbing, and burn back with the MIG system. Hopefully this has given you a better understanding of the MIG welding process and setting up a wire drive system for a MIG welder. Thank you for watching and if you have any questions please don't hesitate to call.